Sonic Speaks. Hello and welcome to Sonic Speaks. And on this week's podcast, we have the man behind, well, some many, many, many sleepless nights. It is uh, Mr. David Cummings of the No Sleep Podcast. Welcome to Sonic Speaks, David. David, it's a pleasure to be here. I can't actually remember where I came across the No Sleep Podcast, but once I did, I binge listened to series one and two uh, and then basically did whatever I could to get the season passes for... (laughs) <laughs> for three and onwards uh so it's it's a wonderful podcast david uh how did you how did you get into well let's start at the beginning how did you get into radio in general well in terms of my love for listening to uh sort of drama and uh, certainly the scary stories on the radio goes back many many years to my my younger days <laughs> there was a uh, a radio station in toronto where i grew up toronto canada and uh, every Sunday night, they would have an hour of comedy. So they'd play cuts from uh, stand-up comedians' albums. And then after that, they would have a show. And, you know, I can't remember the name of it, but it was essentially, it was an hour-long uh, radio drama of shorter, uh, scary stories. And I don't know yeah. if it was the Inner Sanctum or the Outer Limits or, you know, those types of shows um, mm-hmm. produced probably back in anywhere from the 40s, 50s, maybe even the 60s. But um, so, you know, I would remember as a, as a young kid lying in bed in the dark on a Sunday night, dreading going to school the next day. And I could sort of, <laughs> sort of escape by listening to these, uh, you know, frightening stories. And I have such fond memories of, of listening to those. And it sort of, that's kind of creeped into the, uh, to the show I do now, because I release each episode on a Sunday. And, mm. uh, and so I always sort of ha- have in the back of my mind, maybe there's somebody out there, um, you know, maybe a teenager who is going to download the episode on a Sunday and then go to bed Sunday night with their headphones on and listen to it. So that's a, <laughs> it's, a it's a slight homage to those days of listening to radio horror. Yes. And those anthology stories were really very good. Uh, we've been we in October, we had Horror Month on Sonic Echo. Uh, which is harking back to the old time radio, uh, getting them off archive.org and just showcasing them as, uh, well, Jack says that it was, it was because I said to him last summer that I hadn't listened to any old time radio. So he decided to, uh, to start up Sonic Echo so that I could listen to it. And, and I've, I've really been enjoying it. And those horror and some of the science fiction uh, are really, um, really very good. Yeah, you know, they really are. And and I think there's a certain timeless quality about them. Um, mm. You know, certainly the audio and the acting style, you know, the way they talk in the 50s with those kind of voices. <laughs> 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 but uh, if, if you can sort of look beyond that, the stories that they tell and the, the kind of emotions they, they are, are meant to evoke are uh, are really timeless. And, uh, and, and I think that's something about the anthology uh, genre in general, or the style of, of, of anthology is you, you will meet a character that you've never met before. Uh, and so there's, there's no history. You're thrust into a situation and the stories that they tell, as you say, are, are timeless. And then that's it. The, you, you don't see them again. Uh, and that's one of the, one of the good things about anthology versus more sort of series based uh stories that that's right yeah you do you get that sort of one-off encounter Mm. and so whether it's the uh you know the creature or the villain the the thing that you're dreading you know that kind of comes and goes or the heroes or what have you yeah you're right you you sort of get that one shot of of the the scenario that you're you're listening to and it can be very powerful and and it never actually or or it doesn't need to have a happy ending which is something that's more series based uh seems to have to have uh your character can be well can go through the situation but then at the end is left uh 
in either a horrible situation or dead or or worse mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that that's right there, there's a lot more freedom that way because you don't mm. you don't have to have that cliffhanger ending that's going to dr uh, draw people into the next episode and mm. uh and so you know, that's right there's a lot more freedom and like you say it's it's very uh it's sort of unique in the sense that you can have stories where the the narrator himself can actually as you say die at the end and you know again you're suspending that disbelief and you're saying okay this can you know i i can i can relate and not, not so much relate to it but you can <laughs> you can accept it and say yeah you know that i could see how that whole arc played through and if the narrator died at the end or if there's that one final scream as the beast lunges at him you know it's uh, it can be pretty effective it can, yes. Yeah. So, so going from there, from your from your teenage, your your childhood days, your teenage days, where where did you go from there? Well, through a myriad different uh, jobs and wanderings, I was a photographer for a while. I uh, spent the better part of the '90s as a, a full time professional musician, which sort of planted some seeds uh, for what I'm doing now because I was able to spend some time in recording studios and be around the microphone and. Uh, you know, just kind of uh, get used to that sort of environment, recording, and, and it was sort of at that time when the whole digital audio scene started to come on board, and it started to become a lot more affordable. So la mm. later on, we we started doing recording on the in, through a digital interface, and you know, doing it on your computer, which was uh, unheard of when we first started back <laughs> yes. in the nineties. So, uh, so that you know, that kind of put a spark in my mind about what's what's possible in in that sort of homemade audio uh, scenario. And, uh, and then from there, I decided, uh, as much as it was fun being a full time musician, uh, it wasn't paying any bills. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, one of those, those minor details, things like rent and food and those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got to deal with those. So I, uh, I went back to school, got a bit of schooling, and then I became a software developer for uh, pretty much 14 years up until last august when something very significant happened <laughs> indeed yes and it was a it was quite the announcement on the podcast itself yes that's right it was uh it was a big step for me back in august i had decided that the time was right and i made the move to full-time podcaster slash audio drama producer kind of guy that i am so that's uh that's my full-time job now my my hobby my passion so I just want to take a little step uh, to one side and ask about the, the podcast itself. Uh, and the stories that go into the No Sleep podcast are, um, are from Reddit's No Sleep forum. And what, what did you have to do to get, uh, do, do you need permission for that? Uh, and where, do you, where have you found your narrators? Uh, and on the occasions where you've adapted things into more audio drama-esque stories uh, where where is that where is that all come from and, and how do you go about putting together uh, the show well back in the, the very beginning uh there was a gentleman who came up with, with the idea of being on the the subreddit no sleep and for those mm -hmm. who don't know the the concept of no sleep is that it's basically a place where people can post stories that they've written uh usually shorter stories anywhere from a thousand to maybe four thousand words and the, the concept is that they are usually written in the first person and they are just what we call campfire stories that have a scary edge to them. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, I spent a night in a haunted house or um, one night I was walking home and this strange guy started kind of stalking me or what have you. And it's, it's sort of meant to be considered realistic to a certain extent. I mean, there obviously there has to be a certain uh, suspension of disbelief on some level yes. because some stories do involve, you know, ghosts or demons or evil spirits or what have you. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the stories are meant to be plausible within a horror context. So we, ta mm -hmm. we talked earlier about the idea of uh, a narrator in a story dying at the end. That's something that in no sleep is kind of against the rules. They, mm -hmm. We try to have these stories that are, as I say, plausible and believable to a certain extent within that context. And so that's, that's what no sleep is all about in terms of the style of stories. And mm -hmm. within that forum, uh, one gentleman said, would anyone be interested in, in somebody doing, or you know, one of us doing a weekly podcast where mm 
we take some of the top stories and just have them narrated and, you know, put it out there for people to listen to. And so there was a great response to that. People were really into it. People said, I'll produce it and I'll narrate and I'll do this and that. And I got wind of it. Somebody uh, made a mention of it on another forum and I took a look at it. And it was right around that time when I was kind of interested in getting, I, I like to say back into voice acting. It's not that I really ever did it, but I, I did some, <laughs> some stuff in the past I was doing, you know, I had recorded some stuff for some friends. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, I'll throw my hat in the ring and I'll offer to narrate a story every now and then. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, and when you make those simple gestures, it's amazing how they can the snowball on you. Yes, they can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I, I just offered to do that. And then what ended up happening is that uh, all these people who were, you know, sort of volunteering to help, they kind of were dragging their feet and they had other things mm -hmm. to do. And so I basically stepped up and said, let me produce the first show and get the ball rolling and then other things will happen. Well, mm. unfortunately, it never really turned out that way. I did the first show and then the second, and then the third. And, you know, sort of before long, it was sort of my my production. It was m me kind of taking care of most of it. Mm. And, um, you know, and that went on for what what I ended up calling our first season, which was... 18 regular episodes and we did a few bonus episodes so about 22 mm -hmm. episodes in total and mm -hmm. I, I finally had to take a bit of a break and sort of reassess how i wanted to approach the show but uh not to skip too far ahead but basically so the the beginning was you know a very informal thing it was just let's get some of these stories and produce them and see what the response would be and mm -hmm. and so to do that in the early days it was really just as simple as contacting people the only way we could and that was through the reddit messaging system mm -hmm. so somebody would post a story and they might be um you know whatever screen name they might have evil storyteller <laughs> or something like that <laughs> so i would contact mr evil storyteller and say you know we're doing this podcast would, would it be okay if we could uh do an audio adaptation of it and mm -hmm. you know it's funny from that very first day till today the response has 99.9% .9 has been overwhelmingly uh, accepting, you know, the authors or the people who write it are really thrilled to have an opportunity to hear other people, uh, not just narrate their work, but sort of adapt it and to bring it to life in sort of that, as you say, that audio drama kind of way. Yes, to, to interpret it uh, as well, because uh, I know from from having written uh, audio drama before sometimes what you hear as the writer is not what gets uh, produced by the actors and, and there's it, it can sometimes be a little bit but it can sometimes just really bring everything so much into in, in, into focus and and it's a it's a wonderful thing to hear your work in the audio medium yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and that's something that I've experienced a lot. And most of the feedback from authors has been uh, in that vein, whereas you'll, you'll get them either they're just sort of over the moon, they absolutely love what we've done. And then there are mm -hmm. some who will say, I loved it, it was completely different than I heard it in my head, <laughs> <laughs> as I wrote it. But, yes. uh, but I still I still loved what you did. And mm. uh and I don't think, you know, I'm, there's probably been some authors out there who didn't like what we did at all, but I never heard that kind of feedback, fortunately. <laughs> so they, uh, they sort of bit their tongue and uh, kept it to themselves. But uh, yeah, that, that's right. You're, you're absolutely right. We do that sort of interpretation of their story. And mm -hmm. we do, our approach is, for the most part, to do the story word for word. We will rarely take a story and kind of adapt it as as something that perhaps you're more used to where you're creating an actual script. Mm -hmm. um, this is really just, we're narrating. I sometimes call what we do an enhanced audio book. So we're, yes. we're, you know, we're reading yes. each word as it is. And, you know, we'll, some of the stories will have multiple narrators and all the stories we're doing now have sort of a custom music soundtrack and we do add sound design and so on. But it's really, yeah, we're, we're, we're keeping to the story itself as opposed to turning it into a scripted work. So in terms of the audio effects and, and the music, things got started quite, quite simply, but, but they have evolved as, as things have gone through the seasons. Uh, how, how has that come about? 
Well, you know, when we first started back in those very early days, as I mentioned, when I was just this sort of uh, placeholder producer, so to speak, where I, I was just trying to fill in and get some shows uh, released and hoping that there would be some momentum that other people would pick up on. Um, I just it, it came to my mind that if we just did the straightforward unadorned narration, it might end up being a little bit dry. And so I, you know, mm. I kind of thought back to those those days that I mentioned earlier about the lying in bed, listening to those scary stories. And they always, of course, had the great music, uh, you know, that, mm -hmm. that sort of what we would call today that kind of cheesy organ music that <laughs> is, is so stereotypical <laughs> of uh, those kind of horror stories. But mm -hmm. um, so I thought, yeah, you know, this needs to have a bit of music to create a bit of a mood and an atmosphere. And and then on the other end, uh, in sort of a pragmatic uh, approach, it was the fact that putting a bit of music underneath can kind of cover up some of the deficiencies in the audio. You know, back in those ah, days, yes. um, you know, myself, I had a relatively inexpensive uh, USB microphone. I, mean, I think most of the other narrators did too. Nobody... Mm -hmm. Uh, who, who's been involved in this project is is really kind of professional at what they do. They're mostly people who are hobbyists or, uh, you know, some some of the people nowadays are, are a little bit higher than that on the scale. But, you know, back then it was relatively uh, done on the cheap with uh, lower quality microphones and open source software and editing and that kind of thing. So that was, you know, one of the reasons why music became a bit of a, a safety net that it, it could cover up some of those audio deficiencies. Yes, it's it's always uh, it's it's a very difficult thing when you've got uh, people recording from all over the world, and this is something that I've experienced as uh, someone that's done audio drama uh, a fair amount. You will get very great differences between um, between microphones. I know that one of the groups I was with called um, Dream Realm Entertainment they covered this up by uh, producing a story called uh, Robots of the Company where everyone was a robot so everyone's audio got filtered to be robotic and that covered up that problem entirely that's that's great i, I love <laughs> i love that aspect and it's funny you say that because that's something that uh uh, we did, I'm trying to think, it was maybe a couple of seasons ago, but we had this recording come in and uh, the narration itself was really good, but just the quality, the technical quality of the audio was was rather suspect. And, and I thought, you know, should I get it re-recorded -re or what have you? And then I thought, you know, the 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 type of story that it was, it was just absolutely perfect again going back to the 1950s style radio drama it had that kind of tone to it it was kind of a classic haunted house story and i thought you know mm -hmm. what i can do with this just just as you said about the robot voices i filtered it to make it sound like i was playing a scratchy old record and so ah, yes. it, you know I, I sort of built up the story and said you know this is you you've, you've gone up to the attic and you're searching around and you find this old turntable and this crate full of these old vinyl lps so we're going to take one of these scary story lps put it on the turntable and here's the story and you know you hear the needle oh, drop yes. and the scratching and stuff <laughs> and it, you know i think it, it was really really effective and and even then i talking about the cheesy organ music that's exactly what i put underneath it was that kind of sound and uh, it's one of my favorites to this day. So, yeah, it's fun how you can do that. You can mess around and uh, use audio tricks to to cover up some of the things that you'd uh, <laughs> rather yes. not have heard. As it's gone on, you have collected more and more narrators. I suppose as the as the show has grown, take us through the the, the stages. In the earlier days, it was, well, in a way, and it still carries through to today, there's this sense of, you know, always needing people, always reaching out, probably far too late in the actual process. But, you know, it's it's looking for people and saying, if you can narrate this story, submit it in. And, and back in the early days, it was usually just one narrator per story. Even if there mm -hmm. were multiple parts or, or multiple uh, characters, they would just sort of do those voices. And a lot of times it's not like they changed their voice. It was, again, more of that audiobook style where it's just the narrator speaking all the parts and it mm -hmm. you sort of use your imagination and, and pull that together so um but as time went on it just it it just felt like there was this natural evolution of saying as the as the quality 
of, of the productions overall is getting better simply because I'm learning how to do things better. Mm -hmm. You know, it made sense to bring in more narrators for multiple uh, characters or, or for stories where there are different roles to be played. And mm -hmm. so it's <clears throat> the evolution was really all about going originally from um, from a musical perspective. We started the podcast using uh, basically just a royalty free music that was online that you could sort of borrow and use without any royalties needing to be paid. So it was somebody else creating that music that we slotted in. And then I started creating my own music. And then from there, uh, we started doing stories that I could really start to hear have opportunities for sound effects or sound design. And mm. there was a story back in the first season that involved this sort of creepy person calling a, uh, I believe it was a suicide prevention hotline. And he would, you know, speak these really mystical um, kind of sayings and so on. And so mm -hmm. I thought, you know, let's, let's make it sound like that person's on the phone. And so yes. we did that. And, and the, the, uh, the writer of the story had a lot of descriptive passages about what could be heard in the background as this mystery man was speaking. And so I went out there and I got the sound effects that kind of matched that. And that mm -hmm. really kind of, you know, spurred my imagination. And I thought, you know, that really enhanced that story. That's something I've got to bring to the other stories when it's, uh, when it's applicable. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, uh, it's one of those things that once you get started on, uh, on bringing sound effects and music in, it's very difficult to stop because your so your listeners do have um, a level of expectation, uh, which then has to be met in, in the future. Yeah, that's you're absolutely right, and it's it's funny because my approach now, even even on the, the current day, is I I try to stay away from doing that too much. Like you say, it, it is easy and it is almost addictive to say, oh, I, can, I have got a sound effect for that part, or I can, I can add this mm -hmm. sound in. But I try to make sure that the sound effects that we add are, are going to enhance the, the tension and the dread of the story. So yes. I, I try, I don't make it as quite as fully immersively cinematic as some people might do, where every sound, every bird chirp in the background has to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I sort of make it a little, a little tighter than that. So if there's a story, for example, where it, very early on, it's a bright, sunny Saturday morning and somebody says, a friend came by and knocked on my door, I'm probably not going to add a knock on the door sound effect there because it's, mm. you know, it's not scary. It's just somebody knocking on the door. I, I suppose that's, it, it's drawing the line between uh, having someone narrate a story uh, and then having that person in the story essentially talking to themselves, uh, which, is, which is what if you put in every single sound effect uh, and, and created that cinematic experience, it would be this person probably monologuing in the park. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a very good way of looking at it. That's right. Yeah, you, you want to continue that that spirit of as you say the person is sharing a story with you and you don't want to make it like you're creating an audio drama that this person is on the stage performing they're actually mm -hmm. living what they're what they're going through but at the same time you want to help the, the listener to a, a certain extent use their imagination and place themselves within the story yes uh, one that springs to mind is one that i did recently about the the man who uh, gets the, the violin and uh, not to spoil anything, but he does have dreams and, uh, and is in a hallway in that dream and goes uh, through a door down some stairs and uh, sees someone with an ax. Uh, and I remember in the, in the passage that, that you sent me, it, it said thud. Uh, and so I, I did read the thud but in the final production, that was replaced by a sound effect. Uh, and, and, and so, you, yeah, you couldn't hear everything that was going on around, but it was, it was that particular thud because of, the, because of where it was and the, and the impact it was to have that was replaced with, with the sound effect.
That's right. And I meant to break it to you, David. Your thuds just weren't up to par, I'm afraid. Was, oh, no. <laughs> and I, oh, you I, could have told me sooner than this. You've now just embarrassed me on national radio. Oh, dear. I, I, should, have, I should have been more tactful there, yes. Uh, yes, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that's something that, uh, that happens quite often, that obviously when the person writing the story is, is putting it on paper, so to speak, they, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're recognizing that people are going to read their story. And so they will add things like thuds or bangs or what have mm-hmm. you and that's that's great for the reader but in the case of these audio productions when you do have the thuds as you say uh, it's it's much more effective to replace them and to and one of the things I like doing too is try to create even a the atmosphere of the room itself so mm-hmm. if, if that scene for example were to take place in a bedroom the thud would be somewhat sort of dull, not really reflective. But I think yeah. the scene you're referring to, it was more in the basement or it was sort of in, yes. a, in a stone cellar. So you can add some reverb and, and give that the, the listener that sense of, hey, I'm in a big, dank stone uh, space here and the, the thuds are echoing off the wall. And again, it just sort of ha- it enhances the environment. Obviously, the, the No Sleep podcast has gone through uh, some evolution, uh, especially when it comes to um, the length of the pos- podcast itself. I-, I remember while I was binge listening to series one and two, uh, I was sort of looking at them and thinking, wow, these are two hours long. That's a severe amount of time to be putting in, uh, not just to listen to it, but to actually producing it. Uh, and especially on on such a regular basis as every fortnight. Uh, and And then came... Then came the season pass. Uh, so how how did you make that decision to 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 bring it into uh, effectively this sort of two tier system? Well, it was it was kind of a kind of a fork in the road, literally, in the sense where I had uh, sort of two ways I could have gone. And uh, I had done the podcast for, we were in, in the middle of our second season by that point. So we were probably, if you consider the short hiatus I took for about three months, I'd been doing it for maybe a year and a half. And while I loved doing it, um, I started to realize that it was taking up an awful lot of my time and mm-hmm. it was taking up a, a fair bit of money as well. Not so much in terms of uh, audio hosting and, and all the sort of technical technical things for a podcast because those are in some ways relatively small fees Mm -hmm. but as the show went on i'm the kind of person i was always striving to improve all aspects of the show and so Mm -hmm. that meant buying better software uh, better hardware buying better microphones etc and so i was thinking i you know i've injected a lot of my own money into making the show uh, sound as good as i possibly can and mm-hmm. and so I reached a point where I thought, I don't know if I can continue doing this, um, you know, just financially and time wise. And, mm-hmm. and then I thought, is this something that people might pay for, chip in a bit of money and help support the, the you know, the expenses of the show? And at the time, and I still am to this day, I was listening, one of my favorite podcasts uh, is called Never Not Funny uh, with Jimmy Pardo. It's a comedy podcast. And mm-hmm. he was one of the first back in, uh, in 08, I believe, or 06, maybe they started. And what they did is essentially, you know, I sort of mirrored it almost exactly. They did a couple of seasons of completely free shows. And then they went to a paid model, just just like I did. So basically, they did a show and they offered what they called the primo package. And it was mm-hmm. it was where you could pay twenty dollars to get the full episode, the full sort of two hour episode. And there would be a free version with the first, I think, about half an hour of the show. And mm-hmm. so I thought, you know, they did it and they're successful at it. And that seems like a business model that that might work for me. And so Mm -hmm. it's on one hand, you know, I had that kind of role model to see them doing it. But on the other hand, I I think a big part of it was that I was probably just either too naive or maybe just too stupid or too. (laughs) I I had I had the audacity to say, I'm going to ask people to pay for this kind of show. And whereas if I had uh, been 
uh, sort of uh, tutored or, or uh, you know, if I had some sort of mentor who was guiding me, they might have said, no, 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 you'll never be able to get people to pay for this. Don't even think <laughs> about that. So just in, in that uh, blissful ignorance that I lived in, I thought, I'm just, I'm going to see if this will work. And surprisingly, it did. And it's worked so well that you can now uh, do it full time. Indeed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable that uh, we got to that point. And it's, it's funny because I thought when, when we originally made the move to the season pass, I anticipated it might take about six months to get to the point where the, uh, the revenue was there that I could do it full time. Mm -hmm. And that six months turned into about 18 months. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a bit of a, I suppose, a shock, but it, you know, it came on uh, sort of slowly. Like I realized, okay, you know, it's going to be a while until I can do this full time. So I just sort of was plugging along and doing it uh, after, you know, I'd had a very busy software developer job. And so I was mm. doing 60 hours a week there. And <laughs> so it, uh, it, you know, it took all my evenings and all my weekends and so on. But, you know, I just, I had that sort of passion and belief that one day this would sort of pay off. And so, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a great uh, sort of goal, a uh, landmark to reach where I could say, we're now ready to take this full time. And that's, uh, that's the move I made back in August. Yeah, so there's one and, and the, the podcast itself keeps going from strength to strength, really, I, I, I found season five to be uh, one of the best seasons that, that I've listened to the stories just, they, they just keep on coming and they, they keep on surprising. Uh, and uh, it's it's something about the genre. You sometimes think, oh well, surely I've I've heard all the ghost stories that I can possibly imagine, uh, but still, more comes, uh, and and it's and it's wonderful. It it really is. I I too am am blown away by the quality of writing that 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 is out there, and that people are posting online for free. That's that's mm. the amazing thing that you know, we've developed a great relationship with a lot of authors. And mm -hmm. um, there are some that I know, as soon as they post a story, I've just I, I add it to my list, I just know, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to do this story. And um, yeah, you know, there, the, the growth of the no sleep subreddit itself is a big part of that when when we started the podcast, I believe the the subscribers or the people who sort of you know generally visited the No Sleep Forum regularly was about twenty five thousand people. Wow! Uh, now today it's over two million. Oh wow! <laughs> so <laughs> you you can start to understand that how the numbers have increased and and so what happens is that people start to realize that this is a very uh, this is a great way, if, if I'm a writer and I write horror stories, I can post my stuff here, it's going to be seen by a lot of eyeballs, and mm -hmm. there's the chance, you know, for some of these spin-off things. And, and we're, uh, the No Sleep Podcast is by no means the only audio production of these stories. There are YouTube channels that are, you know, people are narrating stories. Uh, a lot of people have their own little SoundCloud accounts. And so what you're seeing more often is... A story is posted, it gets a lot of good exposure, people are excited about it, they vote it up the chain, and uh, and then the author edits, and they put a little note at the bottom that says, click here to hear so-and-so narrating the story or mm -hmm. reading the story. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that the the overall impact of No Sleep, the, uh, the, the forum, is that people realize it's a great place to share your writing, and it's going to get a lot of exposure. And where do you see the, the future then of uh, not just the No Sleep podcast, but, but podcasting in general? In terms of fiction podcasting, I think that there is so much potential out there, mostly because right now it is such an infinitesimal slice of the pie in terms of mm. the entire podcasting world. Because right now, you know, when you think podcasting or, or when I think podcasting, I think something completely different than what I'm doing. I think <laughs> be, yes. because, you know, most podcasts are in a way are, are sort of like this podcast where you have a couple of people, maybe two, three, four people, and they're just discussing things. So mm. they're going to talk about baseball or movies or what have you. And mm -hmm. if the people are engaging and the, the topic is compelling, it's great. It's very entertaining and certainly worth listening to. Mm -hmm. But the concept of fiction podcasting 
you know, even even in the world of of the the sort of the audio drama, the more traditional audio drama that, that your world is a part of, you know, mm. that's out there, but it's it's almost a little subgenre because I don't know if like the people that you work with and the shows that you work on, do they consider themselves podcasts per se? Yes, some of them do because the to me the the idea of a podcast is it is a piece of audio which is uh, released on a semi-regular basis that can be freely downloaded from the internet. That, to me, is a podcast. Exactly, and and that's the way I look at it too. When when, <clears throat> when I consider my show being a podcast, I think it's a podcast really in in the technical aspect of things. You have an RSS feed that mm. people can grab onto. They put it in their podcatching app, and and that's how they do it. As you say, every week or every two weeks, they download a regular. Uh, episode, if you will, of whether it's a, a full production like you guys do or just an episodic series of shows, mm. it, you know, so the delivery system is a podcast type system. But in, mm -hmm. in terms of content, I think that's where it, it varies. And I think one of the most uh, recognizable examples of that is if you were to go into iTunes, for example, iTunes doesn't have uh, a category related to fictional podcasting and, oh. and when i first started i thought okay i'm going to go in i've created this podcast and now i'm going to have to post it somewhere and i have to choose what category it's in and so i started <laughs> looking for horror <laughs> and i thought yes. wait a minute there's no there's no horror category here because i was thinking that you know that's what we do we tell horror stories Mm. And with most other podcasts, you're looking for a category related to the topic that you're doing. So it's a political podcast. So there's, pol you know, a political subcategory, there's comedy, mm. there's religion, what have you. But there was nothing related to the concept of telling stories within a certain genre like horror. And mm -hmm. so, you know, all these fiction podcasts out there have to kind of shoehorn their way into these categories like the arts category with a subcategory of literature or what have you. Now, we're, mm. we're not talking about arts. We're not talking about literature. We're performing it. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's, it's almost like we're, we're somewhere where we shouldn't be or we don't feel like we fit in. We're sitting at the kids' table over there. And so <laughs> I, I long for the day where... where whether it's iTunes or any of these kind of podcast uh, ranking systems could recognize that there should be this category for people who are performing rather than just discussing. Now, something else that's, uh, that has been introduced uh, as the seasons have gone on is the disclaimer at the beginning. Now, uh, obviously, you're, we, we have a horror podcast here. Um, and whilst not... Um, Oh, what's the word I want? It's not gratuitous. Uh, people should know that if you're if you're dealing with a, a, a horror theme, um, that it's going to be it, it's going to be quite scary. But and and yet the disclaimer has has appeared. Uh, can you just give us a, a little bit of background behind that? With as you say, with doing a horror show. Yeah, uh, th there should be this sort of implicit understanding that what you're going to listen to is meant to give you some of the chills down the back of your neck, and it's <laughs> supposed to, uh, you know, even disturb you at a certain level. Mm -hmm. And when the show first started, I thought, well, we have a little website, and I put a little disclaimer on the website, just written on there, saying that this is a horror podcast. It's meant to frighten and disturb you. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, you should be probably at least 16 to listen to it and, and use some discretion as you do. Mm -hmm. And when it went on iTunes, you get the little uh, explicit rating and you do that because some of the stories, as you say, not gratuitously, but just through natural speaking patterns, will use explicit language and so on. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of where it started and it kind of stayed like that for the first three or four, well, at least three, three and a half seasons. Mm -hmm. And then I guess probably through the result of nothing more than the fact that the show was growing in exposure and the audience was getting larger, uh, more and more people were listening to it. And there was a small group of people who uh, contacted me and basically said, um, some of the content that you're presenting is disturbing enough that if people have experienced this type of trauma in their own lives, mm. then it's going to be very upsetting to them. And so you should consider 
forewarning people and just letting them know that they might be hearing some things that are going to really impact them personally. Mm -hmm. And so some of the most common topics would be if there's a story involving uh, rape, if there's a story involving child abuse, Mm -hmm. things like that, things that sadly people deal with in their real life that you know, they, they might not want to uh, look to their entertainment to sort of <laughs> yes. evoke those kind of t- terrible emotions. And so it, it got to the point, it's, it wasn't so much that people were hounding me or, or berating me for it, but it just seemed to come on very quickly. And, and it was really more a case of sort of saying, oh, I don't have time to sort of answer these emails and to sort of engage these people in a dialogue mm. because that's, I think that's in a way what they really wanted. It wasn't so much, I'm going to shoot Dave an email, just a few lines telling him what I think. He, uh, They would do that. I would respond. They would respond back and so on and so on. And I, yes, to a certain extent, you're right that it is that, but it was also, it, it almost got to the point where I felt like they were really trying to sort of shape my the way I was approaching the show almost to the point where I felt like they were kind of subtly suggesting that um, if I didn't kind of Mm. uh, move things to align with their way of thinking that they might that you know that they might I I, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like they were threatening me because they weren't but it, it was almost like if you continue without you know, providing some sort of warning or disclaimer, you know, <laughs> yes. we'll let other people know about this. And so I thought, rather than, again, engage in this kind of time-consuming dialogue, rather than worry about, am I offending this person and that person and that person's cousin, I just, I, I want to give sort of a blanket disclaimer and essentially just let people know there is a risk that you could hear a story <laughs> that could upset you because of, of your personal experiences. And that sort of covered the whole thing the, or sort of the whole myriad of, of different things. And, uh, and so that's, you know, it came mm-hmm. about that way and it wasn't so mm-hmm. much, um, a reaction in, in the sense of, uh, I'm sick of you. I don't want to hear from you anymore. It was just, I, I sort of needed to protect the show and protect the people who, who genuinely needed to be warned about <laughs> some of the content. Hmm. Uh, I I will make a um, a confession at this point that I I did listen to a story that I I had to stop. I had to skip to to the next one. Not because of um, something that happened to me in the past or anything like that. I I can't even remember what the story was about. But it was it was that scary or that that um, that difficult to listen to for me that. Uh, I, I skipped through to the next one. And, and one of the wonderful things that I like about the podcast is that in the the, the show notes that come up on, on the podcast feed, you can see where the next story will start and, and just skip straight through to that. Uh, and, and so, yeah, my, my confession is that I have found one story too much for me. Yes, and and it's. Uh, I, I'm glad. I'm glad. I've deeply disturbed you. David. That's, uh, <laughs> that's that's my goal. Is is it? Uh, but you, you know, it's 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 really interesting to hear you say that because um, you, you know, I, I, I. I I'm so inside the episodes and inside each story. I've, I've read it a dozen times and then I've, I edit the recordings and I add the music. So I'm very rarely surprised by a story, Mm. you know, stories don't catch me off guard. Mm. Um, So, you know, I appreciate knowing that some people out there do find some of them disturbing for various reasons. Mm. But what was interesting is, is when this whole disclaimer and trigger warning issue came up, um, there was a person out there I saw, who had volunteered to create, I think it was a Tumblr site, and they were going to go through and create a much more extensive list of trigger warnings. And so whereas with the trigger warnings we provide for our listeners are very um, very broad and very general, so it will be things like if there's uh, child abuse or suicide or sexual violence, we'll make note of mm-hmm. that. But it's usually each trigger warning is three or four words long. It's that sort of broad in general. But this person was putting together trigger warnings for each episode. And I, I took a look at them once. And um, 
no word of a lie, each story contained upwards of two or three dozen words. <laughs> Two or, two or three dozen trigger warnings. And it, it's literally any possible, the things that I would never even consider as trigger warnings. You know, there might be a, a, a scene where uh, a mother goes up and takes her child by the hand and sort of says, you know, come, come here, you're going to your room. Just the act of grabbing a child's hand would be considered a trigger warning. Wow. Or, you know, somebody was... Uh, uh, you know, a, a buddy with two buddies are sitting around drinking and one buddy throws a beer bottle at his friend and it smashes on the wall behind him. You know, it's sort of like, well, that's a trigger because, you know, it's it's an implied violence or what have and, and not just the the trigger for alcohol and, and substance abuse. Well, that's a good point, too. Yeah, that's right. There's <laughs> there's all of these things. So and for me, I don't know. I, I suppose I've lived a very docile, sheltered life. But I, you know, I, I confess that this stuff is just way over my head. I, I don't I, I can't fathom that there is a, a, a sort of a group of people or a type of person who needs that much protection. Mm. And, you know, in a way. Unfortunately, there's a part of me that kind of gets my back up and I, I get a little defensive and saying, hey, look, these are horror stories, you know, kind of deal with it. <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, at the same time, I have to have some empathy and realize that there are people out there who have lived horribly traumatic mm. lives. And, and I certainly don't want to be a party to uh, exacerbating what they're going through. Mm -hmm. So from the, the warnings uh, through to... Um, a much happier subject which is uh, the awards that the no sleep podcast has won and uh, tell us a bit more about that it's it's been an amazing uh, aspect of what we do certainly something completely unexpected but the um what what we do or, or the no sleep podcast is part of a sort of a larger category uh, called speculative fiction and that basically en encompasses things like uh, science fiction, horror, fantasy writing. And, and obviously there are great writers and people out there producing, uh, crafting uh, literature of that. And then there are people like me who are taking that writing and adapting it for audio. So um, I'm trying to think of when it started. It was the, sort of the mid 2000s there where... Um, the the parsec awards were created and the parsec awards are basically designed to honor the excellence in terms of podcasting related to speculative fiction mm -hmm. and so uh when the show started and as we sort of gained a little bit of traction i decided well i will you know sort of throw my hat into the ring and say let's see if people will think that what we're doing is worthy of, of some sort of recognition and so uh, I, I submitted the show uh, nomination mm -hmm. and it was um, nominated or at least chosen as a finalist in the best new podcast category back in uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. And we managed to win that award, which was uh, incredibly encouraging yes. and uh, <laughs> completely <laughs> unexpected. Yes, and congratulations so that, for that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so that was a nice, uh, you know, kind of pat on the back. And, and it made me realize that, you know, people are in, in sort of a wider range, not just like no sleep horror fans, but sort of in the wider community mm -hmm. are enjoying what we do. And so I submitted again for the next year in 2014. And we won uh, Best Anthology Podcast, which is sort of, I, <laughs> I like to call it the, the MVP award in terms of the kind of shows that we do, that, where people are presenting either one or two stories a week or like we do five, maybe six stories mm -hmm. a week. But the, the anthology concept and to be, um, you know, to be able to win that and be awarded with that when... Uh, some of the past winners are shows like Pseudopod and the Drabblecast, mm. you know, these shows that are just, I consider to be sort of the real, uh, the heights of excellence in that kind of podcasting. So it was just overwhelming and, and really encouraging to be sort of put at that level. That was a big step for the show. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's because it is an excellent podcast and, and I'm certainly very thrilled to be a part of it um, in the, in terms of being a narrator uh, for it and and I very much hope that that it continues for a long time well yes I uh, 
Oh, all right. Yes, I agree. I have to admit, <laughs> I, I was I was on the fence there for a second, but yes, I agree that uh, <laughs> you know it, it's funny that uh, you talk about it continuing for a long time because you know now that I'm doing it full time, there was a part of me that uh, it's it's I don't like to think about my own mortality, of course, but I think you know this may be this might be something that I could do for the rest of my life. Literally, mm-hmm. um, I work from home and. Uh, you know, if even if I decided I want to move to a nice warm climate oh. or, uh, you know, something like that, <laughs> I, I could just my little recording studio and what have you could come with me. And uh, so it's it's, you know, the idea of of doing it well into the future is on one hand comforting and on the other hand, it, it gives me this really solid foundation that I can hopefully continue to grow the show and continue to make it better and better. Mm-hmm. And so whether it's things like just the fact, as we talked earlier about more or um, more authors of such high quality being exposed to the show, having them come on board, um, uh, collaborating with incredible narrators and like yourself. And I say that not to uh, flatter you, but to be quite serious, <laughs> you, you really do. You bring that excellence uh, of narration, which is, you know, so vital to what we do. And so it's great. Yeah. I, I love the idea of being able to do it for a long time and just hopefully get better and better as we go. Well, thank you ever so much for coming onto the show and, and discussing the podcast and uh, the future. And, and I very much hope that, um, that we can continue to listen and, and to work together uh, on the No Sleep podcast. I, I couldn't concur more. And uh, I, I'm going to send off an email right now with all the your upcoming stories. Wonderful. I look forward to receiving it and you'll, you'll get them back tomorrow. <laughs> As always. <laughs> David Cummings, producer of the award-winning No Sleep podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. And then on the other end, uh, in sort of a pragmatic uh, approach, it was the fact that putting a bit of music underneath can kind of cover up some of the deficiencies in the audio. You know, back in those ah, days, yes. um, you know, myself, I had a relatively inexpensive uh, USB microphone. I mean, I think most of the other narrators did too. Nobody mm-hmm. uh, who, who's been involved in this project is is really kind of professional at what they do. They're mostly people who are hobbyists or, uh, you know, some, some of the people nowadays are, are a little bit higher than that on the scale. But, you know, back then it was relatively uh, done on the cheap with... Uh, lower quality microphones and open source software and editing and that kind of thing so that was you know one of the reasons why music became a bit of a a safety net that it it could cover up some of those audio deficiencies yes it's it's always uh, it's it's a very difficult thing when you've got uh, people recording from all over the world and this is something that i've experienced as uh, someone that's done audio drama uh, a fair amount you will get very great differences between um between microphones I know that one of the groups I was with called um, Dream Realm Entertainment, they covered this up by uh, producing a story called uh, Robots of the Company, where everyone was a robot. So everyone's audio got filtered to be robotic, and that covered up that problem entirely. That's, that's great. I, I, love, <laughs> I love that aspect. And it's funny you say that, because that's something that... Uh, uh, we did, I'm trying to think, it was maybe a couple of seasons ago, but we had this recording come in and uh, the narration itself was really good, but just the quality, the technical quality of the audio was was rather suspect. And, and I thought, you know, should I get it re- re-recorded or what have you? And then I thought, you know, the 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 type of story that it was it was just absolutely perfect 
again, going back to the 1950s style radio drama, it had that kind of tone to it. It was kind of a classic haunted house story. And I thought, you know mm. what I can do with this? Just, just as you said about the robot voices, I filtered it to make it sound like I was playing a scratchy old record. And so, ah, yes. it, you know, I, I sort of built up the story and said, you know, this is you, you've, you've gone up to the attic and you're searching around and you find this old turntable and this crate full of these old vinyl LPs. So we're going to take one of these scary story LPs, put it on the turntable and here's the story. And, you know, you hear the needle oh, drop nice. and the scratching and stuff. <laughs> and, it, you know, I think it, it was really, really effective. And, and even then I talking about the cheesy organ music, that's exactly what I put underneath it was that kind of sound. And uh, it's one of my favorites to this day. So, yeah, it's fun how you can do that. You can mess around and uh, use audio tricks to to cover up some of the things that you'd uh, <laughs> rather yes. not have heard. As it's gone on, you have collected more and more narrators. Suppose as the as the show has grown, take us through the the, the stages. In the earlier days, it was, well, in a way, and it still carries through to today, there's this sense of, you know, always needing people, always reaching out, probably far too late in the actual process. But, you know, it's it's <laughs> looking for people and saying, if you can narrate this story, submit it in. And, and back in the early days, it was usually just one narrator per story. Even if there mm -hmm. were multiple parts or, or multiple uh, characters, they would just sort of do those voices. And a lot of times it's not like they changed their voice. It was, again, more of that audiobook style where it's just the narrator speaking all the parts and it mm -hmm. you sort of use your imagination and, and pull that together so um but at sonic speaks Hello and welcome to Sonic Speaks and on this week's podcast we have the man behind well some many 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 sleepless nights it is uh, Mr David Cummings of the No Sleep podcast welcome to Sonic Speaks David David it's a pleasure to be here I can't actually remember where I came across the No Sleep podcast but once I did I binge listened to series 1 and 2 uh, and then basically did whatever I could to get the season passes for <laughs> the three and onwards uh so it's it's a wonderful podcast david uh how did you how did you get into well let's start at the beginning how did you get into radio in general well in terms of my love for listening to uh sort of drama and uh, certainly the scary stories on the radio goes back many many years to my my younger days mm -hmm. there was a uh, a radio station in toronto where i grew up toronto canada and uh, every Sunday night, they would have an hour of comedy. So they'd play cuts from uh, stand-up comedians' albums. And then after that, they would have a show. And, you know, I can't remember the name of it, but it was essentially, it was an hour-long uh, radio drama of shorter uh, scary stories. And I don't know wow. if it was the Inner Sanctum or the Outer Limits or, you know, those types of shows um, mm. produced probably back in anywhere from the 40s, 50s, maybe even the 60s. But um, so, you know, I would remember as a, as a young kid lying in bed in the dark on a Sunday night, dreading going to school the next day. And I could sort of, <laughs> sort of escape by listening to these, uh, you know, frightening stories. And I have such fond memories of, of listening to those. And it's sort of, that's kind of creeped into the, uh, to the show I do now because I release each episode on a Sunday. And, mm. uh, and so I always sort of ha have in the back of my mind, maybe there's somebody out there, um, you know, maybe a teenager who is going to download the episode on a Sunday and then go to bed Sunday night with their headphones on and listen to it. So that's a, <laughs> it's, a it's a slight homage to those days of listening to radio horror. Yes. And those anthology stories were really very good. Uh, we've been we in October, we had horror month on Sonic Echo. 
uh, which is harking back to the old time radio, uh, getting them off archive.org and just showcasing them as, uh, well, Jack says that it was, it was because I said to him last summer that I hadn't listened to any old time radio. So he decided to, uh, to start up Sonic Echo so that I could listen to it. And, and I've, I've really been enjoying it. And those horror and some of the science fiction are, are really, um, really very good. Yeah, you know, they really are. And, and I think there's a certain timeless quality about them. Um, mm. You know, certainly the audio and the acting style, you know, the way they talk in the 50s with those kind of voices. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, if you can sort of look beyond that, the stories that they tell and the, the kind of emotions they, they are, are meant to evoke are, uh, are really timeless. And, uh, and, and I think that's something about the anthology wants would be. And, mm. and so to do that in the early days, it was really just as simple as contacting people the only way we could. And that was through the Reddit messaging system. Mm. So somebody would post a story and they might be, um, you know, whatever screen name they might have, evil storyteller <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so I would contact Mr. Evil Storyteller and say, you know, we're doing this podcast. Would, would it be okay if we could... Uh, do an audio adaptation of it and mm. you know it's funny from that very first day till today the response has 99.9 percent .9 has been overwhelmingly uh accepting you know the authors or the people who write it are really thrilled to have an opportunity to hear other people uh not just narrate their work but sort of adapt it and to bring it to life in sort of that as you say that audio mm. drama kind of way yes to to interpret it uh, as well, because uh, I know from from having written uh, audio drama before, sometimes what you hear as the writer is not what gets uh, produced by the actors, and and there's it, it can sometimes be a little bit, but it can sometimes just really bring everything so much into in, in, into focus, and and it's a it's a wonderful thing to hear your work in the audio medium yeah you're, you're absolutely right and and that's something that i've experienced a lot and most of the feedback from authors has been uh in that vein whereas you'll you'll get them either they're just sort of over the moon they absolutely love what we've done and then there are mm -hmm. some who will say i loved it it was completely different than i heard it in my head <laughs> <laughs> as i wrote it but yes. uh but i still i still loved what you did and mm. uh and I don't think, you know, I'm, there's probably been some authors out there who didn't like what we did at all, but I never heard that kind of feedback, fortunately. <laughs> so they, uh, they sort of bit their tongue and uh, kept it to themselves. But uh, yeah, that, that's right. You're, you're absolutely right. We do that sort of interpretation of their story. And mm -hmm. we do, our approach is, for the most part, to do the story word for word. We will rarely take a story and kind of adapt it as as something that perhaps you're more used to where you're creating an actual script. Mm -hmm. um, this is really just, we're narrating. I sometimes call what we do an enhanced audio book. So we're, yes. we're, you know, we're reading yes. each word as it is. And, you know, we'll, some of the stories will have multiple narrators and all the stories we're doing now have sort of a custom music soundtrack and we do add sound design and so on. But it's really, yeah, we're, we're, we're keeping to the story itself as opposed to turning it into a scripted work. So in terms of the audio effects and, and the music, things got started quite, quite simply, but, but they have evolved as, as things have gone through the seasons. Uh, how, how has that come about? Well, you know, when we first started back in those very early days, as I mentioned, when I was just this sort of uh, placeholder producer, so to speak, where I, I was just trying to fill in and get some shows uh, released and hoping that there would be some momentum that other people would pick up on. Um, I just it, it came to my mind that if we just did the straightforward unadorned narration it might end up being a little bit dry and so i you mm. know i kind of thought back to those those days that i mentioned earlier about the lying in bed listening to those scary stories and they always of course had the great music uh you know that mm -hmm. that's sort of what we would call today that kind of cheesy organ music that <laughs> is, is so stereotypical of uh those kind of horror stories but mm -hmm. um so I thought, yeah, you know, this needs to have a bit of music to create a bit of a mood and an atmosphere. And uh, genre in general, or the style of, of, of anthology is, you, you will meet a character that you've never met before, 
Uh, and so there's, there's no history. You're thrust into a situation. And the stories that they tell, as you say, are, are timeless. And then that's it. The, you, you don't see them again. Uh, and that's one of the one of the good things about anthology versus more sort of series based uh, stories. That that's right. Yeah, you do. You get that sort of one off encounter. Mm. And so whether it's the uh, you know the creature or the villain, the the thing that you're dreading, you know that kind of mm. comes and goes, or the heroes or what have you. Yeah, you're right. You you sort of get that one shot of of the the scenario that you're you're listening to, and it can be very powerful. And, and it never actually, or it doesn't need to have a happy ending, which is something that's more series-based uh, seems to have to have. Uh, your character can be, well, can go through the situation, but then at the end is left in either a horrible situation or dead or, or worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's right. There, there's a lot more freedom that way because you don't, mm. you don't have to have that cliffhanger ending that's going to dr uh, draw people into the next episode. And, mm. uh, and so you know, that's right. There's a lot more freedom. And like you say, it's, it's very uh, sort of unique in the sense that you can have stories where the, the narrator himself can actually, as you say, die at the end. And, you know, again, you're suspending that disbelief and you're saying, okay, this can, you know, I, I can, I can relate and not, not so much relate to it, but you can, <laughs> you can accept it and say, yeah, you know, that I could see how that whole arc played through. And if the narrator died at the end, or if there's that one final scream as the beast lunges at him, you know, it's uh, it can be pretty effective. <laughs> It can, yes. Yeah. So, so going from there, from your from your teenage, your your childhood days, your teenage days, where where did you go from there? Well, through a myriad different uh, jobs and wanderings, I was a photographer for a while. I uh, spent the better part of the '90s as a, a full time professional musician, which sort of planted some seeds uh, for what I'm doing now because I was able to spend some time in recording studios and be around the microphone and. Uh, you know, just kind of uh, get used to that sort of environment, recording, and, and it was sort of at that time when the whole digital audio scene started to come on board, and it started to become a lot more affordable. So mm. later on, we we started doing recording on the in, through a digital interface, and you know, doing it on your computer, which was uh, unheard of when we first started back <laughs> in the nineties. So, uh, so that you know, that kind of put a spark in my mind about what's what's possible in in that sort of homemade audio uh, scenario. And, uh, and then from there, I decided, uh, as much as it was fun being a full time musician, uh, it wasn't paying any bills. <laughs> yes. you know one of those those minor details things like rent and food and those things oh, yeah <laughs> yeah so you got to deal with those so i uh i went back to school got a bit of schooling and then i became a software developer for uh pretty much 14 years up until last august when something very significant happened <laughs> indeed yes and it was a it was quite the announcement on the podcast itself Yes, that's right. It was uh, it was a big step for me. Back in August, I had decided that the time was right, and I made the move to full time podcaster slash audio drama producer kind of guy that I am. So that's uh, that's my full time job now. My my hobby, my passion. So I just want to take a little step uh, to one side and ask about the, the podcast itself uh, and the stories that go into the no sleep podcast are, um, are from Reddit's no sleep forum. And what, what did you have to do to get, uh, do you, do you need permission for that? Uh, and where do you, where have you found your narrators, uh, and on the occasions where you've adapted things into more audio drama esque stories uh, where where is that where has that all come from and, and how do you go about putting together uh, the show well back in the, the very beginning uh there was a gentleman who came up with, with the idea of being on the the subreddit no sleep and for those mm -hmm. who don't know the the concept of no sleep is that it's basically a place where people can post stories that they've written uh usually shorter stories anywhere from a thousand to maybe four thousand words and the, the concept is that they are usually written in the first person and they are just what we call campfire stories that have a scary edge to them. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, I spent a night in a haunted house or, 
Um, one night I was walking home and this strange guy started kind of stalking me or what have you. And it's, it's sort of meant to be considered realistic to a certain extent. I mean, there obviously there has to be a certain uh, suspension of disbelief on some level yes. because some stories do involve, you know, ghosts or demons or evil spirits or what have you. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the stories are meant to be plausible within a horror context. So we, talk, mm -hmm. we talked earlier about the idea of uh, a narrator in a story dying at the end. That's something that in No Sleep is kind of against the rules. They, mm -hmm. We try to have these stories that are, as I say, plausible and believable to a certain extent within that context. And so that's, that's what No Sleep is all about in terms of the style of stories. And mm -hmm. within that forum, uh, one gentleman said, would anyone be interested in in somebody doing or you know one of us doing a weekly podcast where we take some of the top stories and just have them narrated and you know put it out there for people to listen to and so there was a great response to that people were really into it people said i'll produce it and i'll narrate and i'll do this and that and i got wind of it somebody uh, made a mention of it on another forum and i took a look at it and it was right around that time when i was kind of interested in getting i, I like to say back into voice acting it's not that i really ever did it but i, I did some <laughs> some stuff in the past i was doing you know i had recorded some stuff for some friends mm -hmm. and so i thought you know, I'll throw my hat in the ring and I'll offer to narrate a story every now and then. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, and when you make those simple gestures, it's amazing how they can the snowball on you. Yes, they can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I, I just offered to do that. And then what ended up happening is that uh, all these people who were, you know, sort of volunteering to help, they kind of were dragging their feet and they had other things mm -hmm. to do. And so I basically stepped up and said, let me produce the first show and get the ball rolling and then other things will happen well mm. unfortunately it never really turned out that way i did the first show and then the second and then the third and you know sort of before long it was sort of my my production it was m me kind of taking care of most of it mm. and um you know and that went on for what what i ended up calling our first season which was 18 regular episodes and we did a few bonus episodes so about 22 mm -hmm. episodes in total and mm -hmm. I, I finally had to take a bit of a break and sort of reassess how I wanted to approach the show. But uh, not to skip too far ahead, but basically, so the, the beginning was, you know, a very informal thing. It was just, let's get some of these stories and produce them and see what the 